In a time facing the pressures of global competition, in one arena, the United States of America still reigns supreme, feeding the world. And in large parts of America's heartland, corn is king. Now with an ever-growing population and declining prices for their crop, farmers are forced to do more with less or go bust. Every year, America's corn farmers do battle, not just against unfavorable markets, mechanical challenges, and Mother Nature herself, but they engage in a contest against each other to see who can grow the most corn per acre. This is Corn Wars. Uh, we're getting ready to head down and take a look at the, see if we're still on pace and keeping our kernels in the contest field there. I mean, I don't know if you heard, but we had between five and seven inches of rain, not last night, the night before. Pushed the river out again. I don't think it hurt the corn. I think the, actually the water's probably back off by today already, or this morning. In fact, it may be a good thing, kind of flush them nutrients down a little bit in the system, you know. Maybe, I don't know. I'm looking at the positive outlook here. So we'll probably know here in about uh, an hour or so, you know, if we kept kernels up till now. Okay, I think we're ready to move. Now nothing works. Born war, so we'll be duking it out. That's right. So we're kind of down until we figure out what's going on here. I guess it's what you say, it's in your blood. Well, that good thing is if we can make it, make it the next two, three days, I mean, hell, they got it next week being cool. Oh, freaking phone calls. I wonder what the temp, temp's supposed to be today. Man, I tell you what, I've just seen the forecast here. Man, if we didn't abort anything, actually the forecast is sweet. Kind of hope that weather bug's right. We should be able to keep kernels after that. You know, if the weather's right, we got perfect, perfect temperature. Sunlight today, tons of sunlight. So we're maxed out on UV, which we never had. Last two years, we've had cloudy days right, every day through here. Um, I just think we're set up right now as good as we've ever been. And I could see here looking already, it didn't pollinate all the way, all the tips here. So this is what we call the blister stage right here. You see how the corn looks like a blister? So to get to R3, the corn will get a yellow color to it. And then once you get through that, then they'll start filling up with starches and then you get to R4 and then you normally don't abort any. So I'd say we're at the most 10 days away to get into that R4 stage. So. 10 more days, boys, and that's all we gotta do, keep it for 10 more days. Let's go down the river bottom, see what the, what it looks like. Yep, Johnny's mic'd up. He's ready to, he's ready to roll. All right, dog, we're heading down to the bottom. It's actually fairly, well, not dry, but solid down there at Crossroads. You guys not going up the bottom? Tonight? No. Ow! Yeah, 
looks like we're gonna have to do some work on this road. That <laughs> Yeah, we're going to do a lot of work to this. Oh yeah, river's way down compared to yesterday. Oh yes, water is gone. Awesome. Be right up here is where the water was at yesterday. Hey, this is what we want to see. Slate drop. Eight, ten foot already. Yeah, well, there was water all the way up there. And you can see how far it's backed in now. Awesome. Yep, this is a good deal. I wonder if a guy can get out. I'm trying to think how a guy can get out in there. I think we can get around over this way. Wowzy. So what we're looking at here, this again is the same hybrid that was in our contest, planted the same day. And look at the ear placement. It's almost two foot lower oh, wow. in this field than what it was out there at Crossroads. Let's just see what we got here. But the neat thing is, this was treated too. What we did here, we managed it high when we planted it, up to V6, and then we kind of laid off on it, and then come back in at about 1200 GDUs and poured the coals back to it. So I'm thinking, still great potential here yet, but uh, you can just tell, evidently, that high management all the way up through has given us the opportunity for you know a hundred plus bushel corn here. I tell you what, it looks good. As you can see, you got one down, one up. Not there's a a runt behind it, but you know you look over there, and part of this is compaction. This is kind of where probably about where a road is where we haul our manure down. But you know I, I look over a little bit further. It looks a little bit more even. The cool thing is, we don't, you know, it's all pollinated all the way to the tip. That's exactly what we're shooting for. I don't want to see any tip back. If you got it, why not grow it? Say so you don't plant thick enough. Well, I don't think it's that. I think that if you have tip back, either part, part of it's mother nature or number two, uh, um, it's sacrificing on nutrients, and as you can see, um, you know we're pollinated to the tip, so it ain't it ain't that. So this could be another good field here, real good corn. How good? Don't know yet, but it's going to be good. <laughs>
unfortunately there's a lot of bad stuff that can happen between now and then and not a whole lot of good stuff that can happen between now and then so we shall see where we go from here I guess How's it looking then? Pretty awesome. Yeah, one and two look crappy. One and two look crappy? Yeah. What? It's all the leaves are dead looking. All I'm doing is cutting the leaf that is feeding the ear of corn. And I think it's called a sap sample, but I'm not quite sure. There's two different ones. So this is the first one. My hours aren't as hard as his hours. You know, I don't work as much as he does. And we've just kind of adjusted, the boys and I have, if we want to go do something, we just load up and go. Yeah, this is where it gets tricky. I don't know, I didn't think, the, I didn't think one or two looked bad. You didn't? I think it's just because that's where the sprayer runs. Oh, okay. So the leaves so just look a little why. leaves look a little tattered. Yeah, they do. That's and a little tired. That's what I was saying. Yeah, I think it's just because the sprayer was running there. I mean, so far we're struggling a little bit, honestly, with the um, fertility, just because of, it was so dry for a while. short on potassium right now and obviously as you can see in here we've got uh, quite a few Japanese beetles so in a situation like this you've got you know an air that didn't pollinate completely because the beetles clipped the silks off we've got multiple challenges we've got some disease um, some rust starting which is not a huge deal, it's just common rust, not southern rust like um, the guys further south would face. Those are two completely different diseases. Southern rust is a, is a bad deal. Um, common rust is not quite, not quite the level of intensity that uh, southern rust is, so we should be fine there. This has already got fungicide on it, so at this point we should have arrested basically any further development unless it just keeps raining and keeps raining and keeps raining. So. This is a non, yeah, this is a dry land field. All of our stuff is dry land, so we have no irrigation outside of what falls from the sky, so. I'm not gonna kiss her on camera. <laughs> Love you. Love you. It's rock and roll. At least you weren't here last week. You'd be soaked through by now. I mean, it'd be like 95 at 11 o'clock in the morning with a 75 you know, degree dew point and just miserable. It's like a 3 4 t shirt kind of day. Let me show you this project I'm working on. The biggest thing as far as struggle wise this year is you've got a crop that you really, nationwide, that you really have no idea what it is. I mean, you've got so many different challenges. I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna, hold on, stand by. Let me plug my MC belt in. Don't hit. Good Lord. See, if I could have ears all of them like that, I'd be driving a new truck, boys. So you take all of these. The way they're positioned in the row, see, look at this. Perfect example, this thing is at least 20 around. So you take an ear like this. Now this is an outside row, of course. But you take this outside row in the context of our strip intercrop, okay? Whereas we're averaging 16 around, this one is 20 around. So 
you've got a 25% increase in rows around and you can say, well, we're only going to, the kernels are smaller. The thing is, in this case, the kernels are gonna build out. So on a 16 where they fill the gaps and then they come out, the 20 where the gaps are already filled, they're just gonna come out. So that's why when you look at something like this and you say, well, 16 around, 20 around, what's the matter? They're the same size right now. Well, they probably are the same size right now. But what you're gonna find is later in the season, this 20 more than likely will have built more out. So in the context of the strip intercrop, that's where this shines because even if you have a less than perfect stand which this one is and a lot of the outside row is now let's say you take a perfect stand you put full sunlight on it for more than half the day and you give it basically the best growing conditions that you can give it how many outside rows can we get because those outside rows are what's going to drive your field average now at the end of the day the field average is what matters but if we can, the more of these outside rows that we can make 400, 500 bushel on that we have, the higher our field average is going to be just by default. So that's why this is exciting. You've got, you know, we take the average ear on the inside of our fields is a 16, and we're turning that into a 20 simply by putting it on the outside row. So that, that's why this strip intercrop is so exciting, and that's why, you know, if we can fix the problems with it, which there are, there are many problems. If we can fix those problems, this becomes a game changer. And in, in all reality, what it does is it makes, if you do this enough, it makes anybody who's not doing it completely uncompetitive. Boom! Get it! Cut! So they're supposed to give me about an hour heads up and then when the plane leaves the airfield. So as long as I don't miss that call, I'm gonna guess it's gonna be 10 o'clock. It's already 9.30. I'm putting on like five gallons of acres, so I have no idea what that's gonna look like. You can put fungicide on to control disease. You can keep the Japanese beetles from eating the silks off. And we can keep feeding it. And unfortunately, in a, in a dry land situation like we are, with the equipment that we have, at this point, we're pretty much done going in the field from the ground. About all, everything we're gonna do from here on out will be from the air. Just because the corn has put so much height on that um, we can't get through it without damaging the leaves and we're knocking it over. And if we knock it over and, and break it off, that's the end of the game, so. So at this point, we're basically uh, airplanes only, so. I miss, to this day, talking with my granddad, but I get a chance to talk to my dad every day and share ideas and challenges. We were just putting on some fertilizer that we call kryptonite, and it's got a real bright green color, and it almost looks like glitter when you apply it on corn. You know, neat thing on the East Coast, a lot of history. And we farmed the land there at Mainland Farms. It was first cultivated in 1609. And it's been farmed ever since. And we crop that. It's just not a couple miles from Jamestown where the first settlement was. Captain John Smith and Pocahontas. So we live amongst all that history. You know, this land's been farmed since 1609, and here we are, what, 2017. So over 400 years, and it's still some of the most productive ground around. When the corn gets of a certain size, we don't want to take a chance of damaging it with our sprayer and it's later in the season, we focus on trying to keep our plant 
healthy and green as long as possible. And in doing so, we like to add some fertilizers, some insecticide and fungicides after they're silken. And we use a helicopter as opposed to a airplane. And we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what speed and the right gallons to put out to get the penetration and the coverage that we want. And we we know we can do it with a helicopter. We've seen it. So I, I've stuck with it. And so on the irrigated corn, we'll spray that twice with a helicopter. Like we talked, fungicides don't last for so long. So with that in mind, we um, have to spray two applications if we feel the disease pressure is there. So, you know, we scout, get forecasts, and make applications accordingly. Even though we're shooting for high yields, we still gotta be cautious of spending a dollar. One season with us, is that what you're telling me? Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna be. Be like wicked tuna. <laughs> That's funny. And the neat thing about the helicopter is you can be there with him, you can watch it all be applied. It fills up quite frequently, but he's right there at the farm filling up. So it's like you can be more involved. And I'm hands on. <laughs>